Hello everyone, today we talk about the formation of Western Slavic principalities in the High Middle Ages, focusing actually more on the before, right from the migration era. As a better introduction to the topic, we discussed uh, widely uh, early Polish and Bohemian history, we looked at also other Slavic powers, at this point, um, comparatively, um, we still haven't made a video about the Great Moravia, but uh, we will have at a point. And we have already outlined thus some uh, dynamics that can help framing better this specific phenomenon. To, I made a video uh, some years ago, it was probably about 10th century Bohemia, the, the formation of the uh, Permislit Duchy. Uh, which was specific enough, let's say, and that we will come back on because it's one of, in fact, the single most important and, in relative terms, the, the most successful of these creations as far as especially political institutional unity uh, was concerned. We already approached the topic also from uh, the second invasion's perspective. Like, when we talk about the Magyars, especially, we realized that great part of their success in Central Europe was um, due to the support that not just they had in, in, in the same Eastern Frankish Kingdom uh, in the kind of inter uh, say the, the internal political struggle between the, the crown the, the monarchy say better and the uh, the vassals the, the various ethnic dukes but also and especially from the Western Slavic tribes, because at that point were, in fact, forming, crucially, um, and that that were under the same Magyars, by a degree, themselves. So, um, this is an interesting dynamic as far as also the previous centuries are concerned, because, as we will see better now, we'll review it um, just a little bit. It, there are particularly related patterns of the Slavic migrations, um, especially towards the west but in, in the south, but not only um, that have to do with a um, you know say both with the ethnogenesis probably of, of some political groups right but in function of a um, seigneurial government that in part was uh, taken over by uh, Iranian peoples right that left an important trace among these populations, and I already made a video about the origins of, of the Serbians that, as we've seen, are connected with, with pr probably with, with the Sorbs um, as a, essentially as a, a relic of the surviving uh, Polabians that we'll see now today still existing um, in Central Europe between Czech Republic, Poland and, and Germany. Um, and that um, is part, in fact, of this broader tide that you can appreciate, generally speaking, throughout all of Europe during the migration era, um, which continued, however, uh, beyond what, in fact, in, in a narrowly Western sense, we would call the migration era, basically it ends with the Longbirds, right, with the end of, of the, uh, with the second half of the 6th century uh, AD, right, for many Slavs, the, the migration era would have gone on for centuries still. Um, and also, of course, for just the spontaneous movement that they were, um, say, the, the autonomous one, that also independently from, from other shepherds of people, such as the Avars uh, and other groups, so also, actually also certain Turkic elements, not just the Iranian ones. Um, was uh, was happening right the the concept naturally is quite shaded buried because um essentially before the the fifth and the early sixth century we have really big problems to even track what we call the slavs um uh, in um in a in a broader sense i mean we know that they were scattered already among the other groups that were set in motion, especially, from, in fact, from Central and Eastern Europe, the Goths had an important amount of them. The Vandals, seemingly, were already kind of a, a Celto-Germanic, Germano-Slavic people, by, by some degree. And we, of course, can trace their presence back to, you know, 
many centuries, right? Also classical ethnography had spoken of these peoples that became increasingly less known, of course, the, the more east and north you went. And that likely are, in fact, uh, if we could have a just a photograph of the political map uh, of Europe at, at the time, probably had all had been there for, for quite a while and they also their their migration in the later centuries was not perhaps that um wide right there, there is also another issue here um because the germanic and slavic migrations were importantly different um uh, for mostly a reason of in fact um a difference in in political unity, some sort, like the Germanic peoples fundamentally created some confederacies that had, and that were framed in a kind of, kind of a bigger game as they were closer to the empire and so they somehow had gotten Romanized faster and uh, this made them also more successful, right? Uh, if you look at the big Romano-Germanic countries, they're fundamentally uh, Gaul, Spain and Italy as such. Uh, already in in Britain you realize that th those peoples from the youth land from from northern Germany and and uh, southern Scandinavia were more politically fragmented and this is also what generated banally the, the, the aptarchy right in a country that had previously been like a unitary province uh, and so so the, the Slavs fit a bit in the same group albeit their history would remain uh, essentially shrouded a bit in in the in the mist for 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 other centuries, as fundamentally also the, uh, the the Germanic peoples, even if they had not been Christianized and um, you know civilized, they, they they were documented by by their neighbors, right? So we know what they were doing, and we have say being closer to the. Um, can of Latin Germanic world as it had uh, formed um, as a synthesis, as a hybrid, they got to be um, also think about the sagas, I mean, the, their, their past being kind of filtered more easily, right, and with a greater amount of info. Um, this didn't happen for, for most areas in Central Europe, in Eastern Europe especially, and the Balkans, right? It, we have appreciated also how in late medieval times it is difficult to write the history of certain populations um, in uh, in that area, right? Especially as far as that point. In fact, the less centralized systems were concerned. We talk about Moldova, we talk about Wallachia, right? Of course, with, with Poland, with Bohemia, it's, it's all a different uh, story, right? But when you look at Eastern Europe, uh, Lithuania... Um, the Rus, especially the, the northeast of it, not the Russian Palatinate of Kiev. Uh, the, our information, even at the end of the Middle Ages, is very scarce overall, right? And um, this creates complications, especially as far as this larger groups uh, during the migration era moved, right? And again, one characteristic of the Slavs is the fact that they were less politically compact. Right, they were less socially stratified, um, and some historiographies, as you know, played a bit too much and ideologically on that. Specifically, in socialist times, uh, the, the the broader picture was the fact that the Slavs were so not because they were simply more primitive and less developed, but fundamentally because they had already invented a um, a socialist utopia of kind of agricultural communities that just expanded in a sort of peaceful way and didn't have much of a, you know, a vertical development and militarized leadership in a kind of a seigneurial sense. And so they had to be represented as different from eventually what the the feudalizing Germanic world was, already was, right? And uh, naturally, it's, it's um, th there is some... Um, correctness in this. Uh, it's just the way it's manipulated and framed um, uh, relativistically that, of course, is, is disgusting as much as any trace of socialism, ideologically, that has 
also undermine the capacities of some of these countries also up to quite recent in times to have an objective historiography about anything, right? Um, there is, of course, the, the mythology of pan-Slavism. There is um, sometimes also said that properly the national, the individualistic um, national um, mythology. Uh, so it's very complicated to make this histories. I presume at this point, uh, most, however, of that, as far as especially the the non, um, I mean, aside from countries like Russia, just to make an example, right? We have achieved a, a particularly good amount of objectivity um, and we know more or less that actually that few that there is to know. Archaeology is probably more important here than even the documentary sources as far as we can at least reconstruct at a local level what these communities were about. Um, but for the rest, as you know, archaeology doesn't quite have tags per se, so that there was substantially a, an homogeneous material culture of some sort. We can find of course, differences, but are not really a big deal. And is, historically, we have just to rely on mostly Byzantine sources, especially as far as the Balkans and Eastern Europe is concerned. And that's also why there is less actually about that, because Constantinople wrote in a very different way from which the Latin Germanic Europe did. Um, and therefore, we we can reconstruct much better, of course, uh, Bohemian history, Polish history, thanks to the Western, um, you know, the fact that we're uh, integrated in, in the Western system, per se, they were Roman Catholic, and they would be actually uh, uh, quite successful uh, result uh, for, for them as much as for universal rule, much of that should, should be seen. Now we will discuss partly that too, right? But there is one one datum that we tend to ignore, especially as far as we know so few in general, that is, in fact, what that few actually means, right? And the fact that when we look at Central or Eastern Europe, a great part of the Balkans, in this period that stretches, say, from the, from the 6th to, to the 11th century AD, uh, you see um, a remarkable homogeneity. Again, not due necessarily to an ethnic base, because that's also the um, the actual issue. What do we mean by ethnic? Right? Uh, there is a huge debate, for, especially in the Balkans, as far as, um, of course, this is true also for the, the place of origin of, of the Slavs. If fundamentally, as an area, it would be between today's uh, Poland, Ukraine, and Belarus, right? In, in a in a concrete sense, um, but uh, from which they expanded, especially after other kind of more compact people had um, moved away from areas like today's entire Poland, practically, that was populated by Celts and Germans to um, the same East Germany up to the Elbe, right? Um, but there is also the issue of of how many people did actually move, how how can we calculate the, 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 the demographic ratios? Um, as I was saying before, there is no doubt that from the end of the 5th century, the early 6th century, the presence of Slavs in Central Europe, broadly meant, is indisputable. Right? Um, we can trace their movement uh, also in the eastern parts of Central Europe uh, first, actually, and then the mm, uh, the spread westward, uh, so to the aforementioned parts of um, today's eastern Germany, right in the second half of the 6th century. This is uh, self-evident, right? When you look, for example, at the Longbirds um, that were settled in today's Moravia and, um, and lower Austria and up to the Balaton in Hungary in the south, you realize that when the, the, the Longbirds as a group were migrating in Italy, the northern um, uh, part of their dominion was already being permeated by the Slavs, as those countries are essentially Slavic, aside from, of course, the important Germanic presence as well, and also the, also the pre-existing one, the Celts and, and beyond. So, leaving aside the fact that it, it's complicated, even for those times, to say strictly what was a German and what was a Slav, right? And this would 
remain a problem. I would argue till to this day because you know I've, I've had interesting debate with some followers that also messaged me privately and so on. And, and you realize that of course lots of blending also went on uh, over time, and that there were actual differences in a sense. And the reason why there were is exactly the fact that at the time we can't distinguish between Germans and Slavs. But you understand that even the same concept of you know, the, the self-identification as a German is something that we can um, witness in, in literary form only from the 6th century. And in, in countries where, yes, the Germanic peoples had settled, but that essentially were Roman countries, um, and for which the, the Germans began to write in Latin and to acquire the, the classical historiographical ideas, there were broader peoples like that could have been identified like that. And so that identity event, eventually was absorbed by the same conquerors to a point they would use it to aggrandize themselves on the international arena and so on. So as you understand these topics would require uh, a quite uh, hardcore com comparative um, um, you know insight in in fact the probably the boundaries between the uh, the of the germ between the Germanic and Slavic worlds, as well as with others, by the way, because in the migration era, as, as you know, it's very complicated even to see, like, how, say, the, the Hannic Empire worked, right, was really, you know, at, at the base of it, how and why would this, um, th this people, whose origins are also relative, relatively unclear, could carry out what it did, and just eventually disappearing, just uh, as it, it had um, uh, arrived, it would essentially remain diluted in, in other groups and, you know, but to a much smaller degree. So everything is that complex, right? W when you actually get in the details of the specific finds, etc., you can, you can make these distinctions, but very often the samples overall are not sufficient, especially to determine a quantitative dimension, right? So that, as I was saying before, in the case of the long birds, you can find, um, I don't know, in some uh, uh, Italian or Hungarian graves from the long bird time, like a uh, genoma that is very similar to the one of the modern Polish people, uh, which is quite fascinating because you realize that they, they were coming from there, right, in part. So um, this... this um, uh, the, the how the, the, of course the human mobility is always underestimated um, in general in the historical sense because we have this idea of a fixed set of essentially territorial polities to whom we attribute a sort of as if you know people genetically sprang from the earth to there and that just the source where th these people could could be of course we are open also in popular culture well to the concept of of um, migration and different origins and so on. But it's a, a much trickier um, task than it seems because fundamentally what is understood today, even just as a conventional term, may be heavily affected, identically speaking, by modern contemporary um, values that practically have nothing to do with what how even these people thought themselves. In fact, I, as you know, I'm very critical, I've always been very critical of the way uh, these, uh, any, anything historical, telling the truth, is somehow used by the masses to kind of inflate their uh, uh, their importance, right? As if they, by claiming that you come from a group that seemed cooler than others, you, you had any individual worth um, and we see this especially in those situations where actually there are more strained political, ethnic issues and so on, um, for which at that point a, 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 an analysis of contemporary historiography and in fact politics would, would be more interesting than uh, as, as a topic on its own than connecting it with these older uh, realities, right? So. Uh, nothing is as simple as it seems, and chiefly because we lack evidence. I mean, sometimes we lack, uh, most of the times actually, we, we lack ethnic, clear ethnic dimensions, even for much better documented countries, right? So we can't be fully precise, we can't just have an idea.
in the bigger picture, yes, we know. Again, this this group moved, expanded, but it's difficult, um, or at least it can't be uh, eventually built up over time through ethnogenetic uh, data of, con of current um, of modern the, the modern people populations inhabiting certain countries, like to understand, to derive that kind of dimension for others. Um, but the problem with Central and Eastern Europe is that, seemingly, um, the movements, let's say, the, the genetic changes were greater than in the West, right? This is something we tend to uh, sometimes also uh, mitigate, because from a Western perspective, there is historiographically or ideologically this idea that the West was under threat, were under attack. Right, while well, it was basically the strongest thing existed around, um, and this this groups of invaders at different times were just eventually to be absorbed in the broader, con say, sedentary European civilization. As a consequence, we think also uh, th this is done for different reasons. Mostly, it's a, it's multiculturalism. So the idea that uh, I don't know the Roman Empire was a melting pot of all possible people that where everybody was blended, etc. It's a, a very specifically ideological and political, which is actually against any uh, genetic evidence that we have, because more or less the peoples that um, live in a place genetically were, were, remain the same, right? They could change language, yes, um, but that's also when the concept of ethnicity becomes tricky, right? Um, there were important, like the Romans did colonize demographically, there are influences of that kind, but overall, right, what we can measure from the, the beginning of the Iron Age as broader, you know, groups, in, as far as, uh, as Western Europe is concerned, also Southern Europe, um, aside uh, from, from how you want to over make the, this uh, area's overlap, remain fundamentally the same. When we look at certain, uh, certain parts of in fact, mostly Eastern Europe, but also part of the Balkans, and etc., you realize that, albeit this, the, the general bulk of people did remain the same, right? It was hardly a, subs a genetic su or ethnical substitution of some sort. The change is much more complex for, for essentially two reasons. First of all, this broader Central Eastern Balkan, uh, European and Balkan area was l less populated. Right, more sparsely populated. It's huge, by the way, extensionally, and there were less people than in, other, in, than in the rest of Europe. So, what does this mean? It means that, um, first of all, the reason why this was it was that, that the territory was less hospitable and productive in the first place. It's the same reason why the Romans stopped there, right, as as a frontier, brought them in. Um, and even when they pushed it a little beyond, like in the case of the Balkans. Uh, with Dacia in the north, for example, but there are exceptions, and it's because either in that case Moesia was the only fertile area of the, in the entire Danube, uh, basically, um, and also for for eminently strategic reasons of some sort. We're always political at the end of the day, but that were I don't know. So the Romans needed to uh, mine thing, uh, resources, etc. They they thought of that more strategically, like just. But, um, in general, it, it put these people more in motion. Just the idea of having to abandon a, a land because there could be a raid or uh, the exposure to the steppes. This was also a, a dramatic uh, phenomenon, right? It, the great parts of this crescent that, in fact, stretches from the Balkans to, uh, to, to, the, to the Baltic, right? And compassing in the, in the east this uh, steppes sack, we could say. Um, was deeply affected uh, civilization. I mean, raids, constant pressure, etc., did procure a significant damage to the kind of prosperity, right, of, of the sedentary populations there. Um, on the other hand, it also uh, provided them with that kind of greater mobility that the semi-nomadic peoples of the steppes had, right? So, in other words, the the area that eventually would be settled by the Slavs was mar much more up to changing, moving, right? We've seen it even for uh, 
certain ethnogenetic problems like i don't know the the origin why, why did for example the um uh, you know the the people in Dacia at some point historical so in the middle ages are found to to be speaking a romance language right there is also the all the debate on the origins of transhumans from other areas of the balkans and central europe of course there were some there already that spoke but uh, of course during the migration era we have uh, an impression also from roman sources i made a video about that 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 world belonged now to, to the Gauls, to the, to the what was, were called in a classicizing way the, the Scythians, the, the barbarians broadly met, and not anymore to, to, to Romanity that had existed there for, for a couple of centuries. Um, so it, it's very difficult for us to just, aside from recognizing the, 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 the pretty safely assumable dynamics that occurred there to literally quantify them right to have an idea how many people how did move at the time from here to there and how can we answer that we, we don't even know which people actually inhabited in that area and by people i intend literally a political identity that we can track right and that barely existed uh, uh at least uh, in a trackable way in fact uh, we do find Slavic confederacies as well. There are the seven tribes in, in Bulgaria. There are that eventually would be hegemonized in part, as you know, by the same Bulgars uh, later on. That pro at some point you can't know how they they had even formed. Even all the debate on the um, ethnogenesis of of the uh, Serbs slash Sorbs. You know, had it happened in in Central Europe, did they come from the, the Caucasus from 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 Iranian um, regions, it's um, like there are some hypotheses. Some are better than others. We can't find some match because it's obvious that you can't find a trace of that. I mean, people were were moving all around. Uh, every single people in Europe, uh, uh, up to Portugal, we have tr uh, trace of the islands. Uh, as I made a video also on, on them, by the way. Um, but this doesn't tell us. It, tell us exactly what happened. We, we rely on some kind of inferences, legions, hypotheses, mostly speculation. And, and some of that make a lot of sense, but we can't fully prove them, right? So we are condemned, in a sense, uh, to stick mostly to archaeological sources because most of these, these historical, I mean, historiographical ones are... Um, are have been found, right? So th there is no really a hope to find some hidden manuscript that tells us, oh, well, here is a in imprecise detail what happened in the 6th century because, you know, see, they wrote it at the time <laughs> and um, uh, we, we forgot about that because it was just uh, under the dust in a monastery somewhere. It doesn't work like that, unfortunately, very unfortunately. Um, so when, when I make these videos, you, you think that I take off the tangent and that, uh, and I basically uh, just get lost somewhere. But as you know, I also deal with things more more in depth, in detail. I have a particular bias towards the, the political and territorial side of the story because in a kind of a military sense, it's also something that helps you um, rec take measuring the the degree of the institutional effectiveness of certain polities, in fact, certain powers. Um, and in the case of the Slavic migrations, we can definitely see there is uh, a bit of both the hypotheses. From one side, yes, they were mostly, like, again, less stratified, more politically fragmented groups compared to the Germans. And again, it's there wasn't even a huge difference just per se, but it's as if the Germans had also gotten in them lots of other peoples that especially at the time of the Hannic migration arrived just next to the Roman border let's say and began to pressure that and so compacting more resources in fact in lands that were also generally speaking more more resourceful like I don't know the the, the Rhineland or the, the the areas of Pannonia were, were surely more productive in, even if they weren't actually a match at all by Mediterranean standards, then, in fact, the, the Pripyat marshes, that are actually forests, by the way. Um, 
so that definitely did mean a lot. I mean, even the fact that what we talk at, uh, referring to, to the Slavs, so this concept of divine glory of the Slav, etc., that is a universal principle. That is it, also, if you look at the names of these uh, leaders, etc., it's much more deeply and primitively and ancestrally ingrained that even the Germans were already kind of more leaning literally towards a chivalric elite idea, right? The, the Slavs were stereotypically much more still tribal and less confederal in nature. But they did have that as well. So they, while they swarmed in different clans, they, as you know, they permeated basically all the, 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 the Balkans that were under the Byzantines. Uh, they, they arrived in, in the heartland of the Peloponnese. Some mm, took some boats and arrived even in, in North Africa um, on the other side of the Mediterranean. So it's that it's how far they went, right? Uh, they they occupied the Dalmatian coast, they raided the Adriatic, um, one of, of Italy. They uh, we we again, it's difficult to even track exactly where they were. S- some were deported, right? The Serbs, for example, at some point, some groups were tamed and picked by the Byzantines and installed in in Anatolia, right? So we are really looking at a wide range uh, and it's paradoxically this fragmentation that allowed the Slavs to spread so much because as far as authorities like the Byzantines especially were concerned or the others that as you know were quite of a power all around and they had an influence um, not much different from the one that had had the ants in in territorial scale right so Everybody around was affected. The fact that we don't have mostly the northeastern evidence slash perspective doesn't mean that there wasn't a, a, a lot of stuff happening there, right? Because the Slavic chieftains definitely wanted to imitate the uh, the Iranian ones, the Turkic ones, because they were more powerful. Because the steps was dramatically more brutally vertical, compact cohesive and um, militarized and seigneurial in nature. So imagine, again, being most, living mostly in an agricultural society that is also prone to, to, to movement, to transhumanism or even semi-nomadism at a point. Not that the Slavs were, right? But during the migration era, also the Germans passed essentially from a sedentary population to a semi-nomadic one, right? In, in great part. Because uh, that simply means being on the move, not necessarily being, um, uh, uh, you know, a nomadic horseman, right? It's a, it's a different thing. Even though there is a lot of that zootechnical and equestrian capacity that was injected again by the uh, by the, the Sarmatians, the Huns, the others, and so on. And for this reason, you have. Of course, these people, also you understand from the name, were fanatically exalted in the purely traditional view of the world, like ruling the world, conquering divine glory, uh, you know. And again, in the Slavic etymologies, even even more powerfully than the already heavily militarized Germanic onomastics, right? They, and exactly because they didn't have much power individually, they were striving. Right to to push. This is typical from an ideological point of view. That the the less kind of power you have, the more you you have to make this dramatic effort, individualistic one, to 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 rise to to in fact um, make the difference in this enormous cauldron. Right, where it's incredibly difficult to centralize because resources are fundamentally scarce. Mm-hmm. And you you see these, you know. Uh, nomadic populations, all drilled, ferocious, ruthless, and so also equally exalted with the celestial uh, uh, imperial uh, religion uh, from their uh, from from Central Asia that had existed from from millennia, right? That also, in fact, the Indo-Europeans had basically stemmed from, as you know, and that they re- they had reminiscences of in all their mythologies. We have seen it very often for all the all the Indo-European religions, which was, was actually the same one at the root. And they began to be co-opted by these people. So in part, they were subjugated and literally shepherded, um, deported, moved, right? The idea that, I don't know, the others needed, very stereotypically, again, because you could have also the other way around. Sure, surely happened, but by 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 scale, by 
in quantitative proportion, we think it was the uh, the first case, that they needed, I don't know, while settling on the Danube, infantry. Right? It, it, that the Slavs could provide also in a relatively cheap way, because they wanted to move. They, they wanted to reach the, the better pastures, the more fertile lands, and they had the opportunity of doing it under these warlords. Right? And so that would be an integration, the capacity to mobilize Slavic tribes that were also independent right, from the Avars, more or less. But even there we can see a pattern. Like, Just look again at the four, aforementioned Moldova or Wallachia compared to Hungary in medieval times. They're basically some of the same patterns. Right? And mobilizing these forces against Constantinople, sometimes actually said using the Byzantines as supporters is especially su- true for the... The, the the one uh, uh, from the the other that lived from from on the right bank of the Danube between that and the Balkan mountains could go again switch quite easily as an orientation but um, the other important feature here is that the Slavs remained fundamentally sedentary right when they stopped moving they 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 were just sedentary before they they would return sedentary after they wanted to be that so the steps. Uh, peoples, like the Huns, the Avars, the, um, the Magyars, just for talking about the, the Hungarian plane at that point, were always this kind of more imperialistically s- step-like kind of people that had to uh, keep on raiding, right, before finally settling down by, by the 11th century, after the defeats at the hands of the Germans by, by the tent. Um, and that, however, had established an hegemony that they would assert on these surrounding peoples, such as the Slovaks, the Serbs, etc., always as a potential threat, not because it was easy for the others, say, to reach the, you know, to go into campaigning into the Sudeten or in the, in the Balkan mountains. That's where they also had not just logistical strains, etc., but could end up ambushed and so on. That's the same reason why, uh, also in the Rus, while uh, the Mongols would invade and subjugate them as vassals, like Mongol cavalry fundamentally stopped uh, uh, at the at the forests, right? Because entering them was definitely risky and complicated and costly. So these patterns existed from a long time and it's easier to conceive this enormous space, mostly very, very permeable, very um, still kind of self-aware politically, internationally, before the Christianization took place, that definitely boosted their capacities dramatically forward. But that was already a product of kind of a more active um, political reality than we think. I was always surprised to appreciate the fact that the Polish armies in the 11th century were composed by one-third of mounted elements. Right? If you think about that, it's striking. Because Poland, aside from the southeast, it's not a, it's even a particularly suitable land for for cavalry just per se. Right? You know, it, it does have some, some areas where, of course, it's uh, widely possible to, to use cavalry in its, its greatest effect. But um, you find those proportions uh, rarely in countries that do not have a heavy step influence, that are not already habituated to reason seniorially um, in, a, in a way that you can find, in fact, in the, also in medieval Polish schlacht mentality, um, that, that would remain ferociously and proudly uh, and fanatically there for, for, for all its its history, right, and and that's um, actually a very powerful gluing factor. Like, if you wonder how the the, uh, the Poles that were actually just one of the tribes that inhabited roughly in today's Poland could could manage to to create fundamentally a a set of uh, of, of principalities at least with with a broader overlordship, similarly to what happened in the Rus from from Kiev. It's um, you you can't. Uh, avoid to look at the broader, you know, uh, capacities of the local lords to, to, to operate. It may have been still modest by, again, um, post-Carolingian standards, 
in, in in neighboring Germany in the rest of what had been uh, what was the empire the Western Empire. However, considering the local resources, the the local populace, and 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 the general uh, like the fact that I mean you're banal in this lands urbanization had never existed historically and um, the um, again the, this uh, step influences had always kind of rendered life difficult um, it was colder mainly for, for the agriculture of the time uh, that was extremely delicate right this had a huge consequences in the crop rates and so on so you can appreciate there some um, political formation that perhaps exactly in this more sheltered kind of Polish and Bohemian reality. It was definitely located at a frontier of multiple worlds because uh, you have the Frankish one, the, the essentially the, the Magyar one. This eastern one was perhaps more kind of uh, controlled by, by the eastern Slavs and evolved in a slightly different way but you also have the Baltic North that the Slavs yes went at sea through as well but not in the same scale of the Scandinavians at least so you 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 definitely see that there is a, a, both an influence of these this external pressure in pol for political compaction but also some pre-existing awareness that cannot make countries again that had never had a firm territorial reality appearing for the first time like in the 10th century right around there surviving as countries still today fundamentally and with a distinct culture distinct identity and a you know a successful past right you know when you look at uh, bohemia poland both like as, as most european nations they had actually their moment of top right uh, continentally wise uh, in the 14th century, uh, Prague was the was the heart um, of Europe, um, culturally speaking. Uh, po the, the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth was was, was a superpower in in, in in modern times. So there is a lot that can be learned, in my opinion, from this trend. Right? There were some, of course, shortcomings. That in all these monarchies, uh, as it was evident by the late Middle Ages and modern age, were essentially uh, determined by the say showed proven by the the elective system. In other words, the monarchies hadn't made it to centralize differently from what paradoxically the, the ones emerging from post Carolingian the, the post Carolingian feudal world had succeeded in doing. As you understand, even Germany, even though it was probably a fully westernized country uh, narrowly meant did have still a, a an elective monarchy and it wasn't like a single country as you know um, and that's in fact a specifically central European uh, and it go uh, characteristic it goes across in fact the German and the Slavic world, right uh, Eastern Europe was different right Eastern Europe really was different um, to the point that there was, at least by the late Middle Ages, the modern age, much more similarity between, say, the Germans and uh, the, the, like today, telling the truth. Up to, to, to this day, between the Germans and the Poles, the Germans and the Czechs, then even the Poles and the, say, and the Russians. Um, yeah, and this is uh, very evident. We have completely lost the concept of a middle European culture. As a some of something on its own, because we have been obsessed mostly with, first of all, north and south, while still the divides in Europe are by far larger between west and east, um, and especially this idea of, in fact, whenever you resume the concept of westerner, something that is is very narrowly uh, just about, um, say, some countries that, however, sometimes do not deserve. It's mostly based on wealth and very often just alleged or perceived wealth right in, in qualitative and quantitative terms for which that's what I actually mean it's mostly like the a northwestern European area across countries that are also very different historically I mean Scandinavia and uh, and the Netherlands or, or, or Britain and Germany like a very but I mean very different countries um, 
and yet somehow it's how it's just a group around which we we think that civilization not not really stand because that would be just even excessive to to claim but that somehow are to be prized today to to be essentially all what is left of, of western civilization while you cannot do that if you do not understand how also those countries came to be and what they actually are today if you don't look in fact at, at the historical process through, through how which that they formed um, uh, and uh, we like to to make essentially very arbitrary associations and categorizations sometimes without looking at a substratum and a core this again happens for reasons that are very you know, contemporary and more sociological than historical in nature by the way uh, at least as far as the, the origins are concerned. But recovering this, the awareness that even, as we have seen, even, even the Russian Palatinate, as a matter of fact, uh, before the, 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 the Mongolian invasions, was, was actually much more similar to Central Europe than it was. Uh, and, and you can appreciate that even in the following history, like, for example, the history of Ukraine, the national identity was dramatically catalyzed in Galicia, in, in Habsburgic times, right? So a world that is deeply and hardcore Central European but by any standard, it, that therefore hardly has anything in common, if not by, you know, for deportations and totalitarianism and, and genocide uh, with anything properly Eastern. Right, and and we tend to uh, to skip that because it's easier, first of all, to be ignorant in general, but also to to pretend certain things that are not um, true for whichever ideological paranoia. Um, and looking at these early medieval centuries helps a lot. Understanding that. By the way, I made a video about the similarities between P.S. Poland and the Kievan Rus, as far as this uh, kind of uh, hegemonic principalities were, were concerned, right? And also the intervention in a, that existed between the, the two polities reciprocally at different times. So there would be a lot more to say just regarding this premise, but um, we can't also make a four hours long video. Um, so when we look at, again, the, these early centuries, it's easier to look at it as a much more homogeneous thing than we think. Not compact, but still homogeneous as far as also the intertwinement, the connections, the context really were. For example, the southern Slavs in the Balkans um, fundamentally were cut out from the rest of the Slavic groups, mostly because of the Magyar settlement, right? Great Moravia at some point emerged, as we will see later, because the Avar Khaganate had been destroyed by the Carolingians, and so there was this huge uh, gap that uh, of power that was mostly filled at that point by by the majority of the population was Slavic, right, in nature, just like the modern country of, of a Hungary doesn't speak a Slavic language, but uh, genetically speaking, right, a great part, at least, of, of local population had uh, Slavic, uh, has still today a Slavic origin, right? You can't trace, uh, in fact, in a cultural linguistic called, I mean, sometimes by some indicators also, but it, 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 I mean, the product of a certification occurred a long time ago, right? Uh, and in this this gap was was filled at some point by Great Moravia, the stretch from again to today's the territories of uh, today's uh, Czech Republic up to Ukraine up to Serbia, right? So that was a, a massive bridge that had existed that had at that point the uh, collapse of the Avar Khaganate, essentially the entire Slavic world connected with one another, contiguous, right? Uniform. Then eventually the Magyars installed themselves and they cut the southern Slavs from the north. Yet, the mutual contacts between these two chunks, so essentially the, the northern Slavdom, we can say, so the western and eastern Slavs, roughly, um, so also up to the Rus in, in the 9th and 10th century, and the, the, the southern Slavs in, in the south, in, in the Balkans, uh, remained lively and intensive 
up to, it's fair to say, the first half of the 13th century. Right After that, uh, let's say, properly, uh, countries like Bohemia and Poland compacted in a, in a fully Western direction. In the East, you have the Mongols that fundamentally hegemonize uh, the, the Rus up to the Baltic, practically. So also Lithuania is practically influenced by, by that. Um, and the Balkans are in part even actually westernized by a degree as well because of the Fourth Crusade and the imports from Germany, from Italy and all these countries as we've seen. I made a video about Eastern Balkan warfare between the 11th and the 14th century where I explained that there are, there are massive influences early on from you know uh, the Norman Kingdom of Sicily, from later the the, the Renaissance, the Italian city state, um, from 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 Germany. So there is something like that. Eventually, those lands, however, are lost to the Ottoman Turks. So at that point, that Slavic unity that we could conceive, right, uh, up to at least starting from, you know, up to the the, the Magyar. Uh, settlement that broke it, that started breaking it until, in fact, the Ottoman conquest is never recovered. Right? There is properly not. A, these countries are beginning to gravitate around other worlds or are, are incorporated within other worlds. And the differences can be really striking because at that point, even properly statehood has in these countries all a different profile, a different mechanism, a different function. Uh, the most important entity, of course, remains Poland. Uh, and uh, that is a country which has also some hegemonic, important hegemonic ambitions and has to readapt its own face, especially in the 16th century, to by re-esternizing, you know, the Polish Hussars, this kind of even anachronism, because it has to rule over this, in fact, enormous central and eastern European space that uh, constitutes such um, a vital part of, in fact, European uh, uh, of of the European political unity, right? And we tend to give it for for granted nowadays, right? That the the areas that stretch from the the Baltic to to to, to the Black Sea are of crucial political and strategic importance and that's why it's, it's also just the obvious reason for which um, we should support uh, a European empire from, from the western side aside from the, you know, the abomination of, of post-Soviet world to just even be a new protectionistic colonial empire. So I think Europe has just the, the, the vocation for because it's literally that. It, it cannot exist but being that and we have a huge cultural legacy in which to sit uh, thanks to in fact uh, also historical uh, awareness that doesn't quite exist in the rest of the world by the way even the close one geographically uh, so the, the western Slavs and just to, to get down to that included the, the ancestors of the peoples that we know we have known, because some have actually disappeared as such, as the Poles, the Pomeranians, the Czechs, the Slovaks, and the Polabians. Mm. Uh, so, as you understand, it, it's the second and the latter that are no more, or at least that are, uh, there, there are some actually groups, the uh, in Lusatia especially, you have basically the uh, the Polabians still has the Sorbs um, existing. Uh, the Pomeranians practically disappear. Uh, other groups too that um, the Valeti, we will kind of other lactic groups somehow were absorbed both by the Germans during the Middle Ages and or the, the other uh, hegemonic groups like the Poles. Uh, again, if you look at the, the tribal map of Poland, say by the 10th century, they were just one like properly settled in the center of roughly today's Poland. Um, and they be managed to Germanize all the others, the, the Silesians, the, and they even had, by the way, some ambition as far as, uh, a bit like the one of the Moravians had been uh, historically, like it was a kind of super state, right? At some point they tried to interfere with, with Bohemia and uh, 
there was still the possibility of some different um, profile taking place. Uh, there are also other mechanisms to try to explain now what this wouldn't happen. Bohemia had at that point placed herself under basically the the Emperor. The Poles had done something similar, but as you know, they, they had not by the degree that would bring, in fact, the, the Bohemians literally to be framed within the Holy Roman Empire as a kingdom proper. They would have basically the Empire on their own at some point. Um, the, the Poles remained out, significantly enough, because they were more powerful. Bohemia was and, and, but the kingdom, and the Dutch and the kingdom later that also included Moravia was a bit too much of a um, you know, a bite to, 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 to swallow, right, all together. But, and, and Germany could simply make leverage uh, on, on the Bohemians uh, to uh, satisfactory to, to, to keep the Poles out, right? So Poland eventually took on a, probably a different uh, direction. But as far as, for example, we, we were discussing um, Vladislas of, uh, I mean, the Jagiellonian, Europe of the 15th century, and you see there that there are wars still uh, going on. Mo mostly Silesia was uh, was the frontier where the, the clash between the two crowns occurred, right? At a time in which Bohemia was fundamentally losing its autonomy as well at the end of the Middle Ages. In any case, um, from a linguistic point of view, we can divide this group into Right, the the northern one, so the so-called lectic group, which, along it, that includes along with the Polish, the dead Polabians and Pomeranians. The southern one embracing said the Czechs and the Slovaks. Now the languages of the southern part of the Polabian area are preserved, as we were saying before, as relics in today is um, Upper and Lower Lusatia. We can make a video about that uh, region. Um, and occupy a place between essentially the, the Lechtic and the, um, the Czech and Slovak group. Right. If you look at the further western area of this region, you find, in fact, the, the extremities of the Polabian tribes, the Sorbo Lusatians and the Polabian Baltics known respectively uh, in the German historiography that came in fact, to define them like this because the, their territories were eventually uh, integrated in, in, in Ger uh, to, to Germany, the Elbe and the Ostsee Slaven. Um, we actually know enough um, in, in detail about the political and social history of those areas because those were the northeastern marches of Germany and uh, the the land is uh, you know per literate enough to to describe what happened and um, also over an important amount of time because these lands were not easily Germanized right it, it took centuries to accomplish that in an area was perennially in unstable, right? This gives you properly the dimension of how complicated it was, not just in this case for, for another people, but from the same, say, natives to to start centralizing from from the, 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 the local resources, right? And we I made a video about the, the mark of Brandenburg that in part describes this process, but we will have to make others in, in detail to, to explain also how uh, those the, the entire region came to, to be Germanized because it happened in different ways in different times also with some destruction think about the foundation of Lübeck right in the 12th century that uh, was in fact rebuilt over the 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 ruins of a of a Slavic settlement that had actually gone destroyed in, in a clash between the same Slavs locally um, and so even some of the most famous centers, in that case, of the founders of, of the Anseatic League and uh, the Baltic Sea trade, etc., was established in a kind of a colonial context, right? When you look at the Baltic Crusades, well, e even though these here were, weren't quite the same as the ones in uh, in, uh, in Lithuania and Prussia, etc., 
they were similar, right? It was an incredibly complicated uh, uh, reality as essentially there, there were same German opponents to, not to the colonization per se, that happened very gradually again for also the local Slavic aristocracy to, to become German, right, or Germanized, right, to remain within the empire. We, we, we see this even in, in countries like Bohemia that retain uh, proper, even though they were somehow mixed, but a, a Slavic majority and an identifiable, recognizable Slavic identity to, to, to this day. Uh, fighting, again, for centralizing, decentralizing, depending on what these markers w were doing, Right. Some of these marches were, for example, useful for the centralizing policy of the Orange South and because they were blocking, for example, develop and development in the North. Uh, so slowing down the process of centralization just there, just to favor the broader power in Germany. So very complex things, which that aristocracy, again, was uh, present of Slavs that had uh, at some point probably enveloped by the, by the same Germans in exchange for... Uh, a formal submission, but that had basically co-opted them, made them entering the, the broader game of the empire at that point. What, what is fascinating about this period is that, you see, those policies was being, were being created at this very point. I mean, the, there was a lot of proxy war with Bohemia, with Poland. It was uh, very difficult to understand who was who in terms of political al alignment. And before this, as we were saying before, the Magyars had fundamentally mobilized the Western Slavs against the Eastern Frankish kingdom, right? And they, they would mostly and typically launch raids, just as the Magyars did, because that's mostly what non-centralized peoples that cannot maintain a kind of a, enough uh, troops to eventually carry out a systemic work of conquest, of territorial annexation. It would, they just raid so they can... Um, pile up surplus home to try to centralize in their land, right? But uh, it was an important force. It was an incredibly brutal and militarized frontier that we also kind of lost track, right? But if you study between the 10th and the 11th century, but also before, we will have to make a video about that. This frontier is, is one of the bloodiest and toughest you can imagine. And some duchies of especially in the east of the Eastern Frankish Kingdom, risked to essentially to collapse under the, the Magyar pressure. And because of these Western Slavs participating, right, the, uh, the Bohemians opened their, their territory to, to let the Magyars cross, arriving further northwest um, in, in Germany through, through that way. Again, it, it's something that some German aristocrats did as well to avoid their land being pillaged and, say, being in poorer areas of the east of Germany that the, the Magyars didn't need to pillage and that would let them, in fact, the latter cross just to reach the, the richer uh, Rhineland where they could plunder more heavily, right? So it's an incredibly and probably boundless world. That's what I, w I was saying before. Think about this as, as a relatively homogeneous area Yes, the the, Frank, the 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 difference between the Frankish and the Slavic areas are, are important, right? But think of of Central Europe as a whole, not having a frontier. I mean, having this hundreds of kilometers deep frontier that is just like a, almost a country on its own, and in, in some cases that would encompass one, such as Bohemia, for example. Um, so. When, when you la uh, look at, the, for example, the Polabians, the Poles, the Czechs, um, you identify in, uh, already some groups, as we were saying before, that were to remain, right, defined with different degree of success and, and political um, accomplishments since those very times. And it is extraordinary because these were tribes, were not yet confederacies, they were not duchies, they were not kingdoms, whatever. They were just tribes. And yet, they earned their place right in, in, the, in this broader picture, which is rare, right? It's also very rare to find, even, in, for example, in the Germanic migration era, a confederacy that was just 
like a previous tribe. I think just the Longbirds uh, were technically just the same tribe named like that that remained the same people. Like if you pick the Franks, the Alamanni, the, the Bavarians, the, the Goths, they were all kind of creations, right? There were just some kind of strange ethnographic connections maybe for the Goths, which was written later in fact in a late antique historiography to, to fabricate some sort of monarchic origin for the effect the heavily hierarchical gods for how they had formed mostly in uh, uh, in Eastern Europe rather than from the places of origin that may have also been you know continu uh, uh, continuatively g given the name to the ethnic core right but about which we can only speculate really uh, so Th this was happening naturally also in a different time, so we can't compare uh, what was happening in the previous millennium right? but with, with now. These tribes were, uh, of course, more advanced. They were starting to entrench themselves, to build the famous gourds, to, to establish a, a similar system that just by osmosis they were imitating from the Frankish world. Uh, so in a feudal direction, it would take a long time before fully kicking in. Right, but don't think again that these countries were so different from one another. I mean, full feudalism in Germany kicked in just in the second half of the 12th century, right? And for countries like Silesia, the north eastern, uh, the northwestern part of Poland, Bohemia, you can't talk about the 13th century as the fullest accomplishment. So it's not a, a different timeline. The Germans were were ahead. But up to a certain point, especially considering that northeastern Germany was much less developed than southwestern Germany, right? Where most of the, uh, in fact, of the, the the power, the 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 influences, the civilizational output was, was coming from, right? As far as the, the boundaries of the uh, of the country per se just were concerned. So it's a pity again that I've never made a video only about the Moravian, uh, the great Moravian state. I just talked randomly about the, the context where it developed mostly the, the video in which I named it most was, uh, you will find it all in the, in the, I think, uh, Slavic history playlist. Uh, the, the, the struggle of Christianization, this word lands that to remain pagan, in fact, until the the, the tenth, the eleventh century, depending on which countries we're, we're discussing. Some also, in this case, the ninth, in fact, uh, and they the they were just beginning, in that sense, to formulate the idea of a state based on a permanent, stable administration that, of course, the church could provide with all the the human skills and cultural legacy and so on um, and that in a sense opened the path also from for this especially this northwestern uh, Slavic uh, reality Rome and Constantinople were battling over the conversion of these people so much that initially the Byzantines arrived then there was a shift and the uh, Romans prevailed uh, which is interesting because the papacy would, in fact, win the, the race uh, for the evangelization of the, the, the Slavs and, and other peoples at the end of the day. Because, yes, Constantinople succeeded with, um, with the Rus, also with the, not, what, not the Bulgars anymore, but the Bulgarians now, so we can talk fully of Slavs. Um, but the most advanced areas of the Slavic world were definitely the ones that were eventually won over by the Roman papacy and the Holy Roman Emperor. Uh, for obvious, let's say, for obvious reasons, especially if we talk about Bohemia and Poland, because there was hardly any capacity of Constantinople to go as far as there. But as far as uh, Moravia, also Hungary, Telling the truth, as a non-Slavic country, but still, you know, there was a competition, even over Bulgaria, as a matter of fact. In that case, the Byzantines won, but the um, the, the Bulgarian monarchs uh, looked quite, with a, in a quite in, interested way, uh, 
to Rome because uh, just they were this looming threat over Constantinople themselves and they could exert an enormous leverage in, in the papacy through them over the Byzantines with whom, as you know, there were severe strains uh, at the time. And the Great Moravia has a great political institutional meaning because it was essentially the first great Slavic state ever existed. Naturally, it wasn't a, a unitary system uh, just per se. It was essentially under the rule of Sviatopolk uh, between 800 and 70 and 94. Uh, a very significant power, as we were saying before, stretching from Bohemia to Ukraine to, to Serbia. Um, so, really exploiting the fairly unstable Frankish frontier in the east and this uh, ga uh, gap left uh, by by the Avars before the, the Magyars came in which produced actually the same decline of of Great Moravia highlighting the, the instability of, of the wall but it, it, again Given the background, given the potential and all, right, the fact that there could be a power like Great Moravia able to defend effectively its own independence, especially from the Eastern Frankish Empire that did go at war against it, not so investedly or committedly, but um, still with an important amount of manpower, uh, spent uh, at the end of the day uselessly because of course there was a broader overlordship that the Carolingians managed to, to, to achieve over the same Moravia but these places as we were saying before could be invaded, raided um, uh, in fact ravaged in, in many ways but they couldn't quite be controlled right? there wasn't quite a center there, was, there were all scattered kind of um, fortified hilltops uh, at the worst these people were habituated even in, uh, entrenching themselves in, in the forests in the mountains carrying out guerrilla um, uh, insurgency there was um, um, a, a brutally fanatic Slavic uh, defensive mindset this emerges prepotently from the sources as far as the 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 military culture of the Slavs is concerned. I mean, the fact that exactly because they mostly inhabited the the least uh, um, developed areas that were more complicated to rule in this frontier, they were habituated just to to that kind of harder lifestyle, and they would take their stand. Right? They weren't much of a mobile force per se. Before we mentioned Poland, of course, in Eastern Europe, further in the Rus. Cavalry was was more important, but as, when we talk about the the Czechs, the, the Moravians, etc., we are looking at um, a very sedentary people, uh, very similar to the Germans. It's so also with they they had their own cavalry. Don't don't get me wrong, heavy and light. They 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 also carried out again their raids through it. They 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 they, they weren't even again. There was a, a radical difference with the with the Franks by, by a degree, but of course they didn't have the means to develop that now professional uh, military class or what would become in the 10th century essentially that that the post carolingian world was mm, developing uh, functionally and stably together with other institutions that again these centers lacked. Great Moravia expanded her frontiers and, and sphere of influence into uh, Little Poland, Silesia, the areas between the Danube and the Tisha in, in the south, um, so also the, the part of Pannonia to the west of the Danube, into Bohemia, uh, at least a part of southern Polabia, essentially extracting tributes. That's how you measure how... A uh, territorial polity uh, 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 at the, the frontier really works right it was about winning over the local communities and paying tribute to you as opposed uh, to the to the franks right um, 
so the raid was just coming there pressuring this community to to give up in a way to sign with you and to bring the stripe to exact even just looting and so you could bring the stuff back and um, paying other war bands and um, as long as the as the system worked like keeping expanding and consolidating further building fortresses um, se essentially securing this, those areas also for more trade uh, to be to be carried out there more further more surplus to be established so everything was extremely unstable it could depend literally on the life or and the death of, of a ruler on a specific battle and in fact great moravia didn't would, wouldn't last for long however considering how many wars occurred with with the germans um, it's uh, internal consolidation and prosperity uh, is is really impressive right again it, it was born out of a contingency mostly of the fact that you see that this this people hadn't been able like the Franks had done to crush the Avars. The Avars exacted tributes from them. Right now they just took their place mostly in an era they were closer to than the Franks were. Um, at some point we'll have to make videos about the, the Pannonian Slavs. We just already talked a bit about the Croatians. Uh, and uh, it, it was a very complex political uh, geography. The, the Byzantines were interfering in all this as we were seen before because um, essentially accepting missionaries uh, as it as it did happen at that point from Constantinople famously enough meant to side with that reality that was threatening the Frankish possessions in in Italy the, the, for, the that you know they were over Rome for example and so the same place that could eventually orient further missions elsewhere so it was an incredibly complicated game we, that's the reason why we must make a video as soon as possible about great morality uh, it, 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 which mediated between the Byzantine Empire and the Western Slavs and the Latin Christendom mm -hmm. however as I was anticipating great Moravia didn't have true foundations that could provide uh, the, this policy like a uh, a, a long-term existence just per se um, at the beginning of the 10th century when the Magyars occupied in fact the Hungarian plain they reasserted a control in the in the region Great Moravia was shattered right also by internal uh, issues because at that point they realized the balance had shifted uh, they preferred to cooperate as we've seen with the Magyars rather than than going on with with a resistance against them I mean you can't really have everybody against especially when they're stronger than you and this process however triggered the rise of Bohemia in the 10th century right Bohemia had being essentially the second most important land after Moravia in this mechanism and it was just better suited for a you know political compaction we have seen it in the video about the Permislit Duchy Prague was already essentially rising at that point as the most important center with, uh, of trade beautifully located in, in the heart of Europe sheltered by some uh, mountains, other forests, um, close enough to Germany to receive a lot of civilizational input and sheltered enough uh, from from Poland um, by by the mountains and also in the south having Moravia as a sort of buffer state uh, between it and uh, itself and and the Magyars, and so also having mineral resources that, however, would be exploited mostly uh, later, and so being able to, to withstand the various storms that were occurring at that point and shrewdly playing of course uh, all the possible cards just to many ways to stay alive but becoming ever more solid and attracting ever more uh, people wealth uh, 
allowing the local rulers to to be ever more proactive right and uh, and also aggressive not just defensive by the way also Poland would be influenced by by this phenomenon by the way north of the Carpathians but perhaps we can see this aspect better in another video uh, so when we look at the 10th century you realize that most we, we haven't seen it strictly in how it, it, it happened, right? The video about the Peninsulas is quite eloquent. I made one about 10th, 11th century Poland, if I'm not wrong, so we already talked here and there about that. But when you look at the 10th century, you realize that Central, Eastern, and Northern Europe, too, began to affirm some polities that fundamentally would remain outlined also to this day. Think about Denmark, think about um, even the Rus, uh, of course, talking mostly about the Russian Palatinate from Kiev, um, there was a deep connection also between these powers as well, because of course the Danes were kind of they would fight against the Slavs because it was an all against all by by some degree, especially in the busy Baltic when there were, for example, Pomeranian. Mm, Piracy, which was uh, a quite important thing. I mean, Pomerania had a mar quite a maritime potential up to very late in time, uh, stemming from that Slavic, uh, uh, independent Slavic background, not not uh, before being hegemonized from, by Poland. So there was a lot of proxy wars in all this context. There is a lot of uh, Slavic, uh, Viking-like activities, for example. Um, uh, we have the consolidation also of the Magyars uh, in what would become Hungary, in fact. The only one of these powers that basically failed, as we were saying before, were the Polabians. Right? Uh, those uh, were shipwrecked, again, because they were too close to the main uh, expansion axis of Germany. They were also smaller compared to Bohemia and Poland, so they, they wouldn't have really a, a capacity even to expand the Baltic further, on the contrary they were gradually worn out both by land and sea, by, by Germanic peoples fundamentally, and so they were mostly integrated in, in another uh, statal organization, it was not their own, their native one, even though again they were essentially the same clans, the same people, the same aristocrats that would be part even of a German nobility later on. Um, there was also a lot of international interplay to facilitate these games, to consolidate their own power. Right? Um, th this is better seen in, in, Rus in the Rus, in uh, Bulgaria, and we will see it in, in another time. But the idea that, however, there was a, like a balance that could be established when, say, a power became too strong and the, the neighbors coalized, even though they, they didn't like each other at all, uh, is uh, a key of interpretation. And even the difference between the Germans and the Slavs did exist, right? There were linguistic differences. Um, it was just difficult to draw a boundary between them, culturally speaking, as well. So it's obvious that polities like Bohemia and Poland... Uh, also identically formed as, as long as the, the state developed, right? This is the same for Germany. I mean, the, 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 there was something similar happening with the, uh, the, the ethnic duchies that historically had formed from different groups that didn't consider Germany as a whole and that was just, in fact, being invented as a concept of a Teutonic kingdom in, in, the, in the elite culture of some 9th century monasteries of St. Gallen or Fulda and so on. However, the divide between the Germans and the Slavs was really felt, right? I know that uh, a lot of Ovid uh, stamps was, say, reinvigorated historically, especially in the last couple of centuries after the end of the Ancien Regime and all the kind of uh, nationalistic and socialistic issues that, at the end of the day, were all still about the, the, a broader path and, uh, however, engineered it through some pretty um, gross mythologies uh, that have nothing to do with European tradition. Uh, 
But at, at the time, too, it is even. It, it was used in a kind of a rhetorical sense, also very late in times. I, I've met it even for the 13th century, right, when the, the Bohemians of Ottokar II would, uh, were asking, you know, support to the Poles to, to clash against Rudolf of Habsburg um, in 1278. Well, Ottokar writes the, the Poles and, 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 and tells them, literally, that there are these Germans that are that want to eat us alive, basically. If the Bohemians are destroyed, the, the Habsburgs will take over. And in, there is this rhetoric of the, the common ancestry of the common people, right? The idea that there was a sort of more still kind of tribally egalitarian sense of, of being different from that other world that, in fact, from the German side, talks only about Rome, the feudal kind of old chivalric symbolism. It was probably a feudal society. Uh, so highlighting the, the aforementioned differences in kind of social certification that still existed in the 13th century would be interesting. Per perhaps they, they were even higher at the time than maybe in the 9th or the 10th. Uh, but this we could perhaps debate uh, in another video. But the, the sense being that still the Western Slavs didn't didn't understand that this is even especially when they were under they were cooperating with the Magyars right against the the Eastern Frankish Kingdom that they could coalize to gain space right for their political establishment to to, to survive to to expand to consolidate and in fact eventually bringing to the um, survival of these countries, uh, right, historically, because even if Bohemia at some point yes was taken over by the yeah, we were still thinking of dynastic rules, right? They would remain countries on their own. The same goes for Poland. That yes, well, at the end of the 18th century was literally erased from from maps, but it, it existed all the way through until the the, the first the end of the First World War as a country for, for all the rest. Um, so, incredibly successful and resilient creations that, of course, by that contemporary era had already consolidated on the base of, of a very long time. Um, but that, again, by the 10th century, you can't quite see as, well, you know, they had to survive practically. And um, uh, it wasn't necessarily the case. I mean, lots of different things could happen for these countries, maybe not to disappear, but at least to take a different form, different shape, a different, to succeed in different ways. I mean, even just uh, for making a big difference in later times. I mean, uh, for example, the the, the Poland-Lithuanian partnership was not necessarily to exist. At some point, the Lithuanians contemplated to ally themselves with the Muslims. That fortunately enough, they, they didn't do that. But the, the question is also, it, it could really depend on a single ruler, on a, sin, a single dynastic line. Even more so uh, when such dynasties had not been affirmed yet. Uh, one must point out that actually uh, the Arpads, the, the Permislids, the Piasts, uh, also the Rikids were quite old. Right, so there is a, an impressive accomplishment of a multi-secular uh, capacity of hegemonization by the side, again, of, uh, of, of dynasties that could have been somehow easily overthrown a along the way. Right? But there were ways also to, to fix this. In the comparison between Poland and Rus, we, we've seen that. Uh, first of all, just uh, cooperating as far as... Uh, uh, political imitation and expanding also from a clanic point of view uh, establishing a, a broader bloodline that would confer sacredly a, a power right so that this wouldn't necessarily bring to the to the to, to the unity of power because it would actually disintegrate them in various principalities uh, that for example in the case of Poland wouldn't be recomposed until the, the 14th century in spite of some moment of greater compaction in the 11th. Uh, but that would still um, make these countries recognizing themselves in a, in, a, in a national tradition at the end of the day. Uh, 
uh, that held. And it didn't held, hold by ha accident, just per se. Um, the m stabilization of settlement um, derived also and importantly from the inter-tribal uh, contacts of different kind, peaceful or also violent by the way. Um, there was also a clanic crisis, meaning that uh, the, the tribal organization that had been traditional to the Slavs essentially gave way to those dynastic monarchies that um, were surely more effective and efficient ways of, of ruling and of building and of expanding uh, and so on. Christianity was a key factor. I mean, uh, this uh, definitely attracted the rulers as uh, the religion uh, could afford an ideology promoting the unity of the uh, this political territorial power in assuring the sacral nature of the ruling power without that right you know the, what is, they they during the, the migration era they had all known christianity but it's not until these centuries in the high middle ages that the political and social structures were ready to consolidate also as far as the the christian standards of again uh, permanent territorial organization uh, banal even just finding the resources for having like stone buildings what this is incredibly costly and rare uh, the the infrastructure was much more uh, uh, labile in, in a sense even before these times um, so Christianity strongly was was strongly supported as a unifying factor or a stabilizer. We've seen it also in the Scandinavian monarchies, or these new political creations, and it succeeded dramatically. Uh, it's important to notice that there wasn't quite a a crusade wage on these people. Of course, as as long as they remained pagan, this could create problems and ignite further conflict with, with the West. But of course, being part of this broader system actually fortified them. Because the papacy was also quite careful not to make the empire too strong at a point. It was starting to become at least aware, aware of its own potential. and um, It was particularly relevant to, to Christianize the ruling dynasty in order to have a, 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 a privileged channel with the papacy for dealing internationally with what, what, what was needed. Because the Christians couldn't just fight against each other if you know, for for uh, as it had been before, like because what, there was a pag and at least more or less attacking it was not necessarily justified, but the papacy wouldn't wouldn't care. As a matter of fact, uh, through that, Christianity would be expanded, but largely Christianity expanded by this internal political calculation, not forced conversion or you know crusades or whatever. But just because it was the more intelligent thing to do. Considering also the aforementioned traditional ambitions of universal empire, right? By as we've seen, it, the, the Christianization was more like a consequence of a pre-existing uh, development of, of the of the people that embraced it rather than any position. But in this sense, also an achievement of the local people in terms of authority, discipline, hierarchy, um, and so not a sort of mob that does anarchically just whatever the hell they want and destroy the country and make it weaker, right? And that's also how many countries did not exist historically because they were just too busy being fragmented, divided, and uh, blind in that regard. So, of course, the sacralization of power among these populations w was, uh, was a big deal because it could be accomplished only if, of course, you received the, the, the decisive moral support of the population, Considering that there was no pre-existing unitary tradition, and that in these countries also the aristocracy would always be uh, would win in the end the, the struggle against the monarchy, and making in fact those countries collapse, let's say in, in late medieval and essentially in the modern time, depending on the chronology. Um, however, uh, this uh, 
power that the, 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 the Promiseless, the PS acquire, wasn't, uh, was, was given by the same, was entrusted them by the same aristocracy, or at least those who had equally received just the support by their, their clients and historically had, you know, had emerged as some, uh, as princes uh, rather than as dukes of some sort, rather than uh, just uh, chieftains, right? So this was a huge success in perspective for these peoples. Uh, and as I said before, just the fact that they continued along the path, uh, you, you really makes you see how, how that is true in perspective. And again, confer, uh, having this power conferred by the universal empire, because the papas and the empire did this together, and so by Rome, and by this they knew because the, these populations were all living at the outskirts of what they thought was the Roman Empire historically. So it's not that they had forgotten it. Or there was a, a time in in the Dark Ages in which nobody knew where what there was beyond. They, the, the, the Slavs knew of the Roman Empire uninterruptedly in the same way, uh, let's say that that would interest them um, accordingly from say wherever the the, the empire the, since the the creation of the Roman Empire. Because again, we don't have their sources, but everybody knew that, that this thing was going on. And up to the 10th, 11th century, in which they technically came to be part of Latin Christendom, and being active power sharers within essentially the empire, right? They will not digress on the ambiguity that I discussed dramatically, in the, especially in the playlist of the Renovatio Imperi of why we're talking about a universal empire that was still fundamentally Germany and Italy, and that would add, in fact, Bohemia and Burgundy, and why, for example, Poland was out of that, but was still within uh, Christendom, of which, in theory, just the emperor was the, the leader of, of all these powers. And there, there were times in which, in fact, Poland did recognize formally uh, the imperial overlordship, but, um, say, from there to being territorial control that never quite happened. In fact, the Poles were always kind of, they even mocked the, the Germans on some occasions because they said, you know, if you have to respond to the Papas, we have just to respond to God, right? But it was not even just a compliment because still they had quite uh, some problem in ruling their own land on their own. So actually they were doing the same thing as far as their own vassals were, were concerned. And um, um, so there is a lot of stuff, as you understand there. Um, what else could we say? The, we highlighted the competition between Rome and Constantinople. We could see the Western Slavs as not necessarily the, the, the balance, the, the tip of the balance here, but at least some important media that uh, took an active role in also the process of Christianization because this could have not been feasible if there had been an opposition in, in the country. And so, again, we explained that all the very good and sound reasons for which to to Christianize, uh, and they most they, they came essentially under the Roman sphere of influence. So, an integral part of Latin Christendom. And also receiving a dramatic input, in their case, in Central Europe, chiefly from Germany, as far as the political, the institutional, the military side of the story is concerned. I made several videos about uh, medieval Polish warfare, in which we highlighted how even great part, even of the, the modern Polish military vocabulary, is German-derived. And that's kind of obvious, because the Germans there were consolidating as even a Again, a professional uh, knightly uh, order uh, of some sort that uh, in, in, in the Western Slavic lands didn't quite exist in the same way. Right? The differences were small, but in, in, um, in perspective large enough to cause this kind of acculturation through the, the German contact. Also, consider that these uh, 
Slavs participated constantly also in the uh, German expeditions. I mean, if you look at what the emperors felt like at this point in Germany or abroad, well, there were, there were Bohemians, there were Poles. Uh, they made experience there. They, they wanted to be inserted in that higher circle, right? They had all to, to earn, to gain, as we have just seen as dynasties, as as houses. They they would receive their their uh, say their confirmation, their blessing, their their permission, even from Germanic rulers to increase power in their own lands with d different favors in exchange of military service and, and vice versa. Sometimes, I mean, there were. As we've we've seen, also in other videos, lots of Germans that settled in Western Slavic lands as free knights that wanted eventually to be under the kings and making career there, because these were fastly growing countries. They were lagging behind compared to again the Frankish Europe, but they were still expanding dramatically. And as far as also the compaction of their political power, given that they weren't quite vast. Uh, let's say, feudal in nature, and they somehow skipped in part that problem. At least in these centuries of um, medieval growth, uh, they had, they even achieved a more unitary control by some standards, at least institutionally, not necessarily in a territorial sense, but in the sense that, after all, we made a video about, for example, medieval Moravia, like, uh, the, the Promiscuous quite early on took the the control of both Bohemia and Moravia. They could clash against one another, um, but it was always the permissless, right? This is very different in larger systems like Germany and uh, others that could lead even to much bigger issues and that were much more intricated as far as the feudal fabric was concerned. However, when um, Europe um, uh, essentially... Uh, contracted in the 14th century, these systems resulted, paradoxically, to be weaker at a point uh, than the, the feudal lands that instead were at that point glued enough in that kind of intricacy to at least simplify the system enough to essentially to, to have uh, a sounder and kind of more s concentrated power. Then, uh, then, especially as far as the monarchies w was co were concerned, I made multiple videos about the comparison between especially Poland, Bohemia, and Hungary uh, there. Uh, and, um, in fact, that would remain, in fact, elective monarchies, which was a big deal. Because, in theory, all monarchies were elective by some degree, but this disappeared in the institutional practice of at least de facto in, in the West, while, again, in Central Europe the thing remained, and not to a positive outcome. Um, so for today, I uh, stop it here. We will keep talking about the Western Slavs. This was just an, an introduction, right? We have to look uh, in detail how these polities uh, affirmed their control. Uh, for today, however, uh, I stop it here. Again, uh, I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. For now, as always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.